Day in the Triffids by John Wineham. The end begins. When a day you happen to know is Wednesday starts off by sounding like Sunday, there's something seriously wrong somewhere. I felt that from the moment I woke, and yet when I started functioning a little more smartly, I became doubtful. After all the odds were, it was I who was wrong, and not everyone else, though. I did not see how that could be. I went on waiting, tinged, but presently I had my my first bit of objective evidence. A distant clock struck, was sent to me just like eight. I listened hard and suspiciously. Soon another clock began, a hard, decisive note, in a leathery fashion. It gave an indisputable eight when I knew things were array. The way I came to miss the end of the world, well, the end of the world I had known for close on thirty years was sheer accident, like a lot of survival, when you come to think of it. In the nature of things, a good many somebodies, always in the hospital, and the long averages, a pit on me to be one of them, a week or so before. It might just as easily have been a week before that, in which case I didn't, I'd not be writing now, or not be here at all. By chance, but chance played it's not only that I should be in the hospital at that particular time, but that my eyes, indeed my whole head, should be wreathed in bandages. That's why I have to be grateful to whoever orders these averages. At the time, however, I was only peevish, wondering what a thunder went on, for I had been in the place long enough to know that next to matron the clock is almost sa- the most sacred thing in a hospital. Without a clock, the place simply doesn't work. Every second there's someone consulting it on births, deaths, doses, meals, lights, talking, working, sleeping, resting, visiting, dressing, Washing out hitherto, it had decreed that someone should begin to wash and tidy me up at exactly three minutes after seven a.m. Seven a.m. That was one of the best reasons I had for appreciating a private room. In a private ward, the messy proceedings would have taken place at a wholly necessary uh, hour earlier. But here, today's clocks. Of their aging variability, but continued to strike eight in all directions, and still nobody had shown up. Much as I disliked the sponging process and useless as it, it had been to just the help of a guiding hand, as far as the bathroom could eliminate it, fa- its failure to occur was highly discouraging. Besides, it was normally a close forerunner of breakfast, and I was feeling hungry. Probably would have been agreed about it any morning, but today was Wednesday, May 8th. It was an occasion for particular personal importance. I was doubly anxious to get all the fuss and routine over before there was a day they were going to take off my bandages. Because this was the day they were going to take off my bandages. I groped around a bit to find the bell push and let them have a four or five seconds clatter just to show what I was thinking of them. While I was getting, while I was waiting for the pretty short-tempered response that such appeal ought to bring, I went on listening. The day outside, I realised now, was sounding even more wrong, and I had fault. The noises it made or failed to make were more like a Sunday than Sunday itself. I came round again to become... Absolutely, absolutely assured that it was Wednesday, whatever else had happened to it. One of the founders of St. Marion's Hospital, close to the wrecked the institution, a main road crossing upon a, v- a valuable office site, and thus exposed their patient's nerve to constant laceration, is vulnerable, I never properly understood. But for these, those fortunate enough to be suffering from complaints and av- unaffected by the wear and tear of continuous traffic, you did have the advantage that one could lie abed and still not 
be out of touch, so to speak, with the flow of life. Customly, the westbound buses thundered along, trying to beat the lights at the corner. As often as not, the pig squeal of brakes and servo shots from the silencer would tell that they hadn't. This released cross traffic would rev and rail as it studded up the incline, and even every now and then there would be an interlude, a good grounding bump, followed by a general stoppage at speeding and tantalizing. To one in my con- to one in my condition, where the extent of contempt contemps had to be judged entirely by the degree of profanity resulting, certainly neither by day nor most during nor during most of the night there was any chance of serene and patient being able being under the influence of that common round had stopped just because he personally was on the shelf up for the moment. But this morning was different, disturbing, because mysteriously dif- different. No wheels rumble, no basses roared, no sound of a car of any kind, in fact, was to be heard. No brakes, no horns, not even a clopping. A few rare horses that still occasionally passed, nor, as they should be at, at such an hour, the cuss of it, tramp, or work beyond the feet. And more I would listen, the queerer it seemed, and the less I cared for it. In what I reckoned to be ten minutes of careful listening, I heard five steps of shuffling, hesitating footsteps, three voices brawling, intelligently, in the distance and hysterical sobs of a woman. There was not the cooing of a pigeon, nor the chirp of a sparrow, nothing but the humming of wires in the wind. A nasty, empty feeling began to call up inside me. It was the same sensation I used to have sometimes as a child when I got to fancying that horrors were lurking in the shadowy corners of the bedroom. We didn't then put a foot out of fear that someone should reach from under the bed and grab my ankle, then even reach for the switch the less a movement could cause something to leap at me. I had to fight down the feeling just as I had to do when I was a child, when I was a kid in the dark. No, and it was no easier. It's surprising how much you don't go out of it. Comes when it when it comes to the test. Your mental fears are still marching along with me, waiting their chance. Pretty nearly getting it just because my eyes were bandaged and the traffic had stopped. But I pulled myself together a bit. I tried the responsible approach. Why does traffic stop? Well, usually because the road is closed for repairs. Pretty simple. Any time now, we'd be long with the panagraphic drills and another touch of oh, oh, variety for the long-suffering patients. But the trouble with a reasonable line was that it went further. It pointed out that it was, there was not even a distant hum of traffic, not the whistle of a train, not the hoot of a tugboat, just nothing until the clocks began chiming a quarter past eight. The temptation to not to take a peep, not more than a peep, of course, just enough to, to get some idea of what on earth could be happening, was immense, but I restrained it. For one thing, a peep was far less simple matter if it sounded. I was in just a case of lifting a blindfold. There were lots of pads and bandages, but the most important, but more important, I was scared to try. A week's complete blindness can do a lot to frighten you out of taking chances with your sight. It's true that they intended to remove the bandages today, but that would be done in a special dim light. They would allow them to stay off only if the inspection of my eyes was satisfactory. I do not know whether it would be. It might be that my sight was permanently impaired. Or that I would not be able to see at all. I did not know yet. I swore that I laid and laid hold of the bell bush again. It helped to relieve my feelings a bit. No one seemed, it seemed, was interested in bells. Again, I would get as much sore as worried. It's humiliating to be dependent. Anyway, but it's still poor a past to have no one to depend on. My patience whittling down something I decided had got to be done about it. 
If I, were, if I were to brawl down the passage and raising, generally raising hell, somebody ought to show up, if only to tell me they, what they thought of me. I turned back the sheet, I got out of my bed, i never seen the room I was in, I was, although I had a pretty fair, had a fairly good idea that uh, my ear of the position of the door, it wasn't all that easy to find. There seemed to be several puzzling and necessary obstacles, but I got across the co- the cost of a stub toe and minor, minor damage to my shin. I shoved out, in the, shoved out into the passage. Hey! I shouted. I want some breakfast. Room 48. For a moment nothing happened. Then came voices all shouting together. It sounded like hundreds of them. Not a word coming through there clearly. It was though I put on a record of the crowd noises. And they all disposed crowd at that. And a nightmarish flash, wondering whether I had been transferred to a mental home while I was sleeping. It was not so merry and subtle at all. Sound of those voices simply didn't sound normal to me. I closed the door hurriedly on the barbell and groped my way back to the bed. In a moment, bed seemed to be the one safe, comforting thing in my whole baffling environment, as if they underl- as to, if to underline that. There came the sound that checked me in the act of pulling up the sheets from the street below came a scream, wildly distraught and conti- contagiously terrifying. came three times, and when it died away, it seemed to tingle in the air. I shuddered. I could feel the sweat pickle my forehead under the bandages. I knew now that something fearful and horrible was happening. I could not stand my isolation helpless any longer. I had to know what was going on around me. My hands went up to my bandages then, my fingers on the safety pins I pulled stopped. Suppose the treatment hadn't been successful. Suppose that when I looked, took the bandages off, I would have find I still could not see. It would be the worst, still a hundred times worse. I lacked the courage to be alone, to find out when they had not saved my sight. Even if they had, would it be safe yet to keep my eyes uncovered? I dropped my hands and lay back. I was mad at myself. The place, I did some silly, weak cursing. Some little while must the pass before I got a proper hold of things again. But after a bit, I found myself churn- churning round in my mind once more after possible explanation. I did not find it. But I did become absolutely convinced that to come all the paradoxes of hell, it was Wednesday. The previous day had been notable. I could only, I could swear no one, no more than a single night passed since then. You find it in the records of Tuesday, May 7th. The earth orbit passed through a cloud, a comet, de- a comet debris. You can even believe it. You like, if you like, millions did. Maybe it is so. I can't prove anything anyway, either way. It's no state to see what happened myself. But I do have my own ideas. All I actually know is the occasion. So I had to spend the evening in my bed listening to my witness accounts of what was constantly claimed being the most remarkable, celestial spectacle on record. And yet, until the thing actually began, nobody had even heard a word that it's supposed to come up those debris. Why they broke it? Why they broadcast it? Considering that everyone could walk, hobble, be carried, was even out of doors, at windows, enjoying the greatest free fireworks display ever. I didn't know, but they did, and it helped to impress on me still more heavily that it, what it meant to be sightless. I got round to feeling that if treatment had been since not been successful, I'd rather end the whole thing then than go on that way. It put it in news bulletins during the day that mysterious bright green flashes seemed California skies. Previous night, however, such a lot of things were still did happen in California. No one could be expected to get dreamily worked up over that, but as further reports came in, this comet debris, Morphith, made its appearance and it stuck. Accounts arrived from all over the Pacific of a night wave brilliant by green meteors. 
that had said to be sometimes in such numerous showers, a whole sky appeared to be wheeling about us. And so it was when you come to think of it. As the night line moved westward, the brilliance of the display was no long, no way decreased. Crazy green flashes became visible even more before darkness fell. The announcer, giving an account of phenomenon in six o'clock news, advised everyone. It's an amazing scene, one not to be missed. You mentioned also that it did. It seemed to be interfering seriously with a short wave of reception at long distances. But that medium wave on which they were would be running in commentary was unaffected, as present was television. You need not have trouble with the device. But when everybody in the hospital got sighted about it, it seemed to me there was not the least likelihood of anyone missing it except myself. As if the radio's comments were not enough. And as I brought me my supper, had to tell me all about it. The sky set me full of shooting stars, he said. All bright green. They make people's faces look frighteningly ghastly. Everyone's got, uh, everyone's out watching him. And sometimes it's, more than, it's almost as light as day. Only the wrong colour. Even now, and even now and then, there's a big one so bright it hurts to look at it. It's a marvellous sight. They say there's never been anything like it before. It's such a pity you can't see it, isn't it? It is, I agree, somewhat shortly. We've drawn back the curtains of the wards so they all could see it, she went on. If only you hadn't had those bandages, you have a wonderful view of it from here. I always said, but it must be better still outside, though. They say thousands of people are out in the parks on the heath watching it all. And on the flat roofs you can see people standing and looking up. How long do they expect it to go on? I asked patiently. I don't know. They say it's not so bright now as it was in the other places. See, even if you do, you had bandages off today. I don't expect they have to let you watch it. You have to take things gently at first, and some of the flashes are very bright. They all, they all, I inquired. It's such a brilliant one. It made the whole room look green. What a pity you couldn't see it. Isn't it? I agreed. Now go away, there's a good girl. I listened, trying to listen to the radio. They was making the same oohs and ahs, helped out by ungentlemanly ungent- tones, which blabbered about the magnificent spectacle and unique phenomenon. So I began to feel it was parley all for all the it, it was a par, parry for all the world going on with me uh, as the only person not invited. I didn't have a chance of and tr- any choice of entertainment for a radio, radio system. Well, I gave you only one program. Take it or leave it. I a bit gathered the show began to wane. It answered advised everyone who had not yet seen it to hurry up. I do so all in his life. He didn't, that he had missed it. The general idea seemed to, to be to convince me. I was passing the, uh, the very thing I born for. In the end, I got sick of it. I switched off. The last thing I heard was this play, which is finishing fast, uh, fast now, that we'd probably be out of the debris area a few hours. There could be no doubt in my mind that this had taken place the previous evening for one thing. I should have been a great deal dry, hungrier than I had, was I had. It had been long ago. Very well. What was this then? Had the whole hospital, the whole city, made such a night of it they had not pulled it round yet? At which, about which point I interrupted as a chorus of clocks near and far started announcing nine. For the first time I played hell, the bell, as I lay waiting, I could hear a sound of sort of monstrousness mentor- beyond the door. It seemed composed of whimperings, sliverings, and shufflings, punctuated occasionally by a raised voice in the distance, but still no one came to my room. By this time, I was flipping back once more. The nasty, childish fancies all were on me again. I found myself waiting for the unseenable door to open the horrible things to come paddling in. Fact, I wasn't precisely sure that somebody or something wasn't in already, stealthily prowling around the room. Not that I'd given to any that to that kind of thing, really. 
It was those damn bandages over my eyes that middle of voices shouted back to me down the corridor. But I certainly was getting in willies. And once you get them, you, they grow. Already they put, they, they were past the stage where they, sh- you can shoo them off by whispering or singing to this, at yourself. It came at last to the straight, came to at last to the straight question. Was I more scared of endangering my sight or taking off the bandages or staying in the dark? The willies growing every minute. If I had been a day a dawn earlier, I don't know what I would have done it very lightly. The same in the end, but this day I could at least tell myself, Well hang on it Well hang it. There can't be a lot of harm if I use common sense. After all, bandages are due to come off today. I'll take or oh, we'll risk it. There's one thing to put my, my, to my credit. I'm not far enough gone to tear them off completely. I sense and self control put get up bed and pull the shade down before I started on the safety pins. Once those cover had the coverings off, I found out I could see the dimness. I felt a relief I never felt known before. Now that's the first thing I did. I was assuring myself there was no there was no indeed were indeed no malicious persons or things lurking under the bed or anything anywhere ever swear to slip a chair back under the door handle. I could indeed begin to get a better grip on myself. Then I made myself take a full hour. Gradually setting used to f- getting getting used to the full daylight. At the end of it I knew a uh, thanks to swift first aid, followed by good memory, my eyes were good as ever. But still no one came. On another shelf of the bedside table I discovered a pair of dark glasses, thoughtfully put ready against my my any my need for them. Cautiously I put them on, for I went right close to the window, the lower pan it was not made right, made to open. So the view was restricted, squinting in sideways. I could see one of the two people who appeared to be wandering on an old kind of aimless way further up the street, but they struck me, what struck me most, and once was the hot sharpness and clear definition of everything. In the distant house uh, tops, wide across the opposite roofs, I noticed that no chimney, large or small, was smoking. I found my clothes hung tightly in a cupboard. I began to feel more normal again. Once, feel more normal once. I had them on. There was some cigarettes still in the case. I lit one, began to get in the, the state of mind where, it, though everything was still in the line of queer, I could no longer understand why I'd been so quite so near panic. It's not easy to think oneself back to the old look of those days. I had to be more self-reliant now. But then there was no such routine. Things were so interlinked. Each one of us so steadily did his little part in the right place. As an e- and it was easy to mistake, mistake habitat, custom for the natural law. And all the most disturbing, though, for when the routine was, was in my way, it was in any way upset. When almost half a lifetime had been spent on one conception of order, reincarnation, reincarnation, it no, it's no five minutes business. Looking back at the shape of things then, the amount we did, did not, we did not know, did not care to know about our daily lives, not astonishing, but somehow it is a bit shocking. I knew practically nothing, for instance, of such ordinary things as how my food reached me, which was where the fro- fresh water came from, bow the clothes I wore or woven I made, how the strangers of cities kept them healthy, all oh, my life had become a complexly specialist, all attending their own jobs with more or more or less efficiency, and expecting others to do the same, it made it incredible, it made it incredible. To me, therefore, all the complete disorganization could have taken the hospital. Someone, somewhere, I was sure, were, must have had a hand, have it in hand. Unfortunately, if that is somebody, it was a somebody who had forgotten all about room 48. Now, this I did, when I did go to the door again and peer out into the corridor, I forced to realize that whatever bad. Well, whatever bad happened, it's affecting a great deal more than a single habitat of room 48. Just then there was one voice, there, 
Just then, no one in sight. Though in the distance I could hear a persuasive mumbling, murmur of voices, a sound of shuffling footsteps, occasional larger voice, echoing, hollering in the hall corridors. And nothing like the din that shut out before. This time I did not shout. I stepped out cautiously. Why cautiously? I don't know. It was just something that induced it. It's difficult in that reverberating building to tell where the sounds were coming from. And one way the passage finished at it at its skewer French window and shattered the balcony rail upon it. So I went the other way rounding a corner. I found myself out in a private room wing on the broader corridor. At the other end of the cried corridor, where the doors were walled, the panels were frosted, save for ovals of clear glass. Clear glass at the face level. I opened the door, it's pretty dark in here. Curtains have evidently were been drawn over the previous night's the play was over. And it is still and there was still drawn. Sister, I cried. She didn't hear, a man's voice said. What's more? He went on. She ain't here for ruddy hours either. Can't you pull them ruddy curves, mate? Let's have them have some flipping light. Don't you know what? Come over the bloody place this morning. Okay, agreed. Even the whole place was disorganized. Didn't seem to be any good reason for the unfortunate patients. Should have to lie in the dark. I pulled back the curtains of the nearest window. Let in the shaft of light, bright sunlight. It's a surgical ward with about 20 patients, all bedridden, let bedridden, leg injuries mostly, severe amputations. But look at it. Stop fooling with me, mate. Put him back, said the same voice. I turned and looked at the man who spoke. He's a dark, burly fellow, fellow with a bit of a beaten skin. He was sitting up in bed, directly facing me and the light. His eyes seemed to be gazing to my own. So did his neighbours and the next man. For a moment I stared back at them. I took that long to register. Then they they seemed to be stuck, I said. I'll find someone to see that to them. With that I fled from the ward. I was shaking again. Shaking again. Couldn't have done with stiff drink. The thing was beginning to sink in. I found it difficult to believe that all the men in the ward could be blind and yet the other editor wasn't working, so I started down the stairs. On the first floor, I pulled myself together and plucked the courage to look into another ward. The wall of my beds were all disarranged. Disarranged at first, I thought the place was empty, but it wasn't not quite. Two men in night clothes lay on the floor. One was soaked in blood, one healed her incision, and the other looked as if some kind of conjection, conjection, had seized him. They both, they were both quite dead. The rest had gone. Back on the stairs once more, I realised most of the background voices I had been hearing all the time were coming up from be- from below. They were louder and closer now. Has it in a moment, but they seemed to be nothing. For he was very bit, but to go on making my way down. On the next turn, I nearly tripped up a man who lay across my way. Shadow, the bottom of flight, lay somewhere Somebody who actually had tripped over him and cracked his head on the stone steps as he landed. At last I reached the final turn where he could stand, looked down into the main hall. Seemingly everyone in the place was able to move most have been may um, move must have been made distinctly for that spot, either for the idea of finding help or getting outside. Maybe some of them had got out while well, the main entrance doors were wide open. But most of them couldn't find it. There was a tight packed mob of men and women, nearly all of them in their hospital night clothes, moving slowly and helplessly around. A motion pressed there on the outskirts, coolly against marble corridors or ornamental projections. Some of them were crushed breathlessly against the walls. Now and then, now and then one would trip. The press of the bodies allowed him to fall. There was little chance he would let him Little, there was little chance it would let him come up again. A place looked well. Maybe you will have to have seen some of Dora's pictures as soon as the hell. 
but Dory couldn't include the sounds of sobbing and numerous moaning, occasional forlorn cry. Me too, it was all I could stand. I fled back up the stairs. There was a feeling that I ought to do something about it. Lead them out into the street, perhaps. They put an end to their dreadful slow winning. A glance had been enough to show. I could not hope to make my way to the door to guide them near. Besides, if I want, if I were to, I did not get to the, if I did not get to the them outside, but when? But then, I sat down on a step for a while to get over it. My hand and my head's, my head in my hands, the awful cogrogement sound of my ears all the time. Then I searched for, I found another staircase, a narrow service flight, which led me out by that way into the yard. Maybe you're not telling this part too well. The whole thing was so unexpected and shocking. And for the time I deliberately tried not to remember the details. Just then I was feeling much as though it were a nightmare from which I was desperately but vainly seeking relief. Awaking myself, as I stepped out in the yard, I still half refused to believe what I could have seen. But what the one thing I'm perfectly certain about, reality and nightmare, I needed a drink, as I seldom needed one before. There was nobody in sight in the little shade side street outside the yard gates, but even most, uh, but almost opposite so, stood a pub. I can recall its name now. The Ephemian Arms. There was a balding hearing, bald hair and bearing, a reputed likeness of a Montgomery hanging from an iron bucket. But I one of the doors stood open. I made straight for it. Stepping into the public bar, gave me a moment to come through, feeling for the sense of normality, persistently ephemerity like dozens of others. But though there's no one in the part, is there something, certainly something going on in the saloon bar, round the corner, heard heavy breathing, a court lift its, lift its bottle, a pop, a pause and a voice and remark, gin blast it, hell to hell with gin. He followed a smacking crash. A voice as me gave a sobby chuckle. So the chuckle. Fresh the mirror. Wash your good mirrors away. Never caught popped. Said damn gin again. Played a voice. Offended. They do hear well with gin. He turned the bone and hit something that so fudded to the floor. And there they're goggling away its contents. Hey, I called. Why want a drink? A silence. Then. Who are you? A voice answered and quite cautiously. I'm from the hospital, I said. I want a drink. Don't remember, don't remember your voice. Can you see? Yes, I told him. Well then, for God's sake, get over to the bar, doc, and find me a bottle of whiskey. I am a, I am a doctor enough for that. I said, I climbed across and went round the corner. A large barrel of red faced man, green Morris moustache, stood there. Clad, only trousers and a colourless shirt. You're pretty drunk. He seemed undecided whether to open the bottle that he held in his hand or to use it as a weapon. Fair, you not a doctor, or what are you? He demanded suspiciously. I was a patient, but I need a drink, as much as any doctor, I said. At Jim's again. You're not got there, I added. Oh, it is damn Jim, he said. Staying away, I went through the window. Went for the window, a lively clash. Give me the Let's Creek Coat Scroll, I told him. I took a bottle of whiskey from the shelf, opened it, and handed it to him with a glass. I filled myself shoes and snip brandy, some little soda, and then another. On that, my hand was it shaking so much. I looked at my companion, he was talking, uh, taking his whiskey neat out of the bottle. You'll get drunk, I said. He paused and sm- turned to me, to warm, to, turned his head toward me. I could have sworn that his eyes really, that his eyes really saw me. Get drunk, damn it! If I am dr- if I am drunk, he uh, said to me, it was perfectly right. I don't understand. Comment. He brooded a moment before he announced, "Gotta get drunker. Gotta get much drunker." He leaned closer. Do you know that I'm blind? That's what I am. Blind as a bat. Everyone's blind as a bat except you. Why oh, are you blind as a bat? I don't know, I told him. So, oh, so that, it's that bloody comet. 
trash that have done it. Green shooting snatched all. Now everyone's blowing as a bat. Did you see green shooting snatched trash? No, I did. There you are, proves it. You didn't see him, but you ain't blind. Everyone else saw him. We wait. Wait, just press his arm. All blind bats. Bloody comments, I say. I pulled myself a very old brandy, wondering whether there might be something in what he was saying. Everyone's blind, I repeat. Fresh it, fresh it, all of them. Probably everyone in the world, said you. Yeah, it is an afterthought. How do you know? I asked. Seem the easy. Listen, he said. We stood side by side, leaning at the bar, a dingy pub, and listened. Nothing but it uh, to be heard. Nothing but a ruffled, dirty newspaper blown down the stinky street. So that's a quietness. I heard everything that cannot have been known in these parts for a thousand years and more. See what I mean? Oh, it's obvious, said the man. Yes, I said slowly. Yes, I see what you mean. I said that I went, I must get along. I do not know where to go, to, where, where to, but I must find out more about this, what, what was happening. Oh, are you, are you, are you the, the landlord? I asked. Well, if I am, he demanded defensively. I do not know that I've got to pay someone for free bronable brandies. Ah, oh, forget it. But look here. Okay, if I tell you, don't you know why? Because that's a good, that, what's the good of money to a dead man? Or oh, fresh old oh, as I ain't good. as just a few more drinks. He looked at a pretty good specimen with his age and I said so. What's good of living blind of bat? He demanded irritably. Fresh, that old boy said. She was right. I mean, she got more guts than I have. When she found out as her kids were blind too, what did she do? Took her into her bed and uh, with her and turned on the gas. Fresh, that what she done. Oh, I haven't got the guts to stick with them. She got pluck, my wife, more than I have. But I soon will have soon. I'll run back up there soon when I'm drunk enough. When, what was there to say? What did I, what I did say to serve it? So no purpose. Save to spawn his temper. He end he groped his way into the stairs, disappeared up them, by one hand. I didn't try to stop him or follow him. I watched him go, then kicked off. Then I kicked knocked off the last of the brandy, my brandy, and went out into the silent street.